Well, good morning, Sue. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good, thanks for coming today. Um, let's do a little uh, bookkeeping first, and I'll just have you state your name, where you were born, and when. My name is Susan Small. I was born in Muscatine, Iowa, August 8th, 1953. Okay, thanks a lot. Now we can relax. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Sue, I know a tiny bit about you, but I'm just going to explore, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in uh, when you first came to the area, to Jerome, to, uh, and from where? So, my parents knew a couple named Ruth and Bill Cruz, also from Muscatine, Iowa. They were very good friends in their youth. And the cruises came uh, to Jerome on vacation. They were driving over Mingus from Prescott, and Ruth looked out at the view that opens up of this valley and turned to her husband and said, Oh, honey, is there some way we could live here? Do you think we could make a living? And that's how they came to, to be here. They bought a little house over on Holly Avenue that's now painted blue. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Frank and Jamie lived there yeah. most recently. And um, they just completely redid that. Now, this is your family or the cruises? These are the cruises. Okay. And uh, they, were the, they were the ones who, who moved here. So my parents, of course, wanted to see what was going on in Arizona that was so interesting. Yeah. And they came to visit them and fell in love with the place, too. And, you know, they were all in their 40s at that point, and they were tired of shoveling snow and... Uh, interestingly enough, both uh, the Cruises, a lot of their family moved to Arizona following them, and a lot of people in my family moved to Arizona following us. No kidding. Yeah. Um, an exodus from Iowa. Yes, <laughs> yes, because who wants to live in Iowa if you can live in Arizona? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. So how old were you? You moved with your family? Here? Yeah. Yeah. 1959. 1959. Oh yeah. my gosh. I didn't realize you were here so early. Yeah. So did your parents buy a home in Jerome? They did. They, they bought a place down on uh, Hampshire, which of course everybody called this upper hogback and that lower hogback. Right. I did not know this was called East Avenue for many years. <laughs> so this is 1959, so the mines are closing. The mines were closed were in 53, 53, really. yeah. Although there was a little bit of mining going on at the open pit at that time. Okay, so uh, was the attraction for your family that uh, not only was it beautiful, but it was cheap? Well, I imagine it was. Oh, it was extremely inexpensive up here. Yeah. Um, I remember, so my dad and Bill Cruz would buy houses and basically flip them. Uh, or also my family rented uh, some houses. Okay. And you could buy, uh, you could buy houses up here for under a thousand dollars easily. Yeah. So they were, so they saw that opportunity as, as well. Right. And so they bought houses in Jerome? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so Bill was a German cabinet maker, and my dad was a carpenter, uh -huh. and he could fix, he didn't like working with electricity, but he could. He could do plumbing and carpentry, and so the two of them made a good team buying houses up here. Yeah. And my dad just did a lot of carpentry and repair work in the area, too. I see. Well, um, might have been a little nerve-wracking. I mean, if everyone's moving out, I mean, the houses are cheap, but were they renting to the new influx at that time, the, um, the, the, this so-called hippie invasion? Or? Well, they, they kind of predated that. Yeah, beatnik invasion, maybe. Yes, actually, that's true. There were some oh, interesting people. Well, <laughs> I remember a fellow named Nicholas Deke renting from them, and he was a photographer, and I have no idea really how he supported the, himself, but <laughs> I remember uh, he asked my parents if we could go over to the Little Daisy, and he would take these pictures of me, and I had a formal uh, dress that I wore, and I was probably 13 at the time, and you know, looking rather ghostly with maybe veils or something and doing that sort of thing. Right. And um, he, I forget, forget where he was from, 
Eastern European of some sort and had lived in Micronesia before coming to Jerome. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but Jerome has always attracted this type of person. Yes, yeah. Um, I remember people when we moved here in 59, there were a number of artists. Um, Russell and Esther Parr, who lived uh, at that house as you enter the Gulch Road from down below, that little house on the left as you start okay. from the hairpin turn to go mm -hmm. up the gulch. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an artist, and uh, we had artists down the street, Ernest Beach Smith and his wife. Yeah, and this is all in the late 50s, early 60s? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. How many, uh, how many houses did your uh, father and partner so, get involved um, in? The, the one that I remember primarily is on, I believe, Center Street, I believe is what it's called. It was a three-story, um, and the Crams were the family that lived there the longest. Uh -huh. It's a huge house. Um, so that one they bought, and uh, the one that's at the top of the Gulch Road, as you would turn off across from Holly Avenue. Uh, who lives there uh, now? Uh, Nancy, Nancy and Mike? Yeah. Okay. So they owned that one, and they owned the one where Robin uh, Anderson and Margot live Down now. Down here on the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, those were the ones that, that come to mind. I, I can't think of any others they actually okay. owned. But I know the one where, um, Mar where Margot and Robin live is yes. the one they rented a lot. I see. Okay. You know, that to a lot of people. Yeah, and so how old are you when you move here? Um, I'm six. Oh my gosh. And not many kids to play with? Not many kids to play with. <laughs> I remember going, well, the Selmas had the house right on the end of the street here. Yes, they still do. And yeah. Or they rented. Yeah. But, yeah. And so I remember coming up to play with Barbara and Bernadette. Not so much their little brother, but the two of them. Those were kind of the people I, and, and the, the kids I had to play with. And the school was still open? The no. grade school? No. Oh, so you... That was in Clarkdale at the time. Ah. And I had, I had friends over on Holly, the Sanchez's. But the high school was? The high school was open, yes. Okay. Yeah. All righty. So there were some kids around. Yeah. Well, you had, um, who were your friends then? Did, did anybody who's still here, like Henry Vincent or any of well, that's I went a to little school, later, I isn't went it? to school with Henry, certainly. Oh, okay. I, I don't remember playing with him so much because he was a boy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, like, my closest friend was Teresa, K, uh, Teresa Sanchez, and her family lived where Linda Heidenreich lives now, Okay. over on Holly. And I had a friend named Teresa Kayona who lived in the in the Gulch. She was a Kickapoo Indian, and um, I didn't really have that many playmates my age, yeah, frankly. Did, did I was. Did you think a, your parents were a little nutty coming here? That why am I here? Or did, did you have? Well, I felt very supported by the community, probably because uh, the cruises were like family to us. And I did have a few friends, and I knew all these older people, and now I wish so much that I had asked them more questions, that I had paid attention to what they told me about the town. Right, but as a uh, kid, you're not thinking of that Right. Yeah. And I would get off the school bus across the street from the Voynichs, Mary and Paul, and Mary would be, if she, if Mary was out in front of her house, she was often out there watering her flowers or sweeping the porch or something like that. And she was wonderful. She knew everything that was going on in town. And I would stop and say hello to her. And she would tell me all the things that whatever the gossip was of that day or uh -huh. whatever she was thinking. And then I would go home and tell my mother and grandmother what Mary had told me. I think I imitated her, <laughs> her gestures or whatever, and <laughs> so, I was the news. So this was uh, Jerry's mom? Yes. Oh, wow. Jerry's mom, yeah. And she was a wonderful cook. She made something called povetisa, where the, the, she would spread this dough out, and it was paper thin. 
and then she would uh, put a mixture of nuts and sugar or whatever it was that she combined and roll it up and make this marvelous pastry. I remember that. I want one right now. Oh yeah, it's <laughs> making my mouth water just to remember that. So, wow, I had no idea that you were here as a small child at that time. That's, yeah. that's really interesting. Um, did you have a sense that, I mean, you could say, you know, the town was dying. I mean, you could say that. You and, could and say that. How many people do you think were here when you got here? Um, I once sat down and tried to remember everyone that I could at that time, and it was over 100, but not much. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah, from 15,000 to yes. 100. Yeah, we weren't here when there were 50. There were more people here than that at that time. Yeah, well, that's always been the folklore. Or yeah. It went down to 20 people. I'm not sure that's so accurate. I don't accurate. know how accurate that is. Yeah, yeah. It sounds good, but... Yeah. But it, it was small. It was small. And there were people who had been here during the time that the mines were going. Um, like the Lomelies were here, and my neighbors across the street, the Ortizes, uh, and... There were widows I know in town, like Marcelina Yampe, who was a friend of Cleophas Ortiz, our neighbor across the street. And there were there were people who were related to the mining um, activity, yeah, the yeah, mining days. Right, yeah, right. Um, Mrs. Gutierrez, and of course uh, the, the Tamale ladies. Of course, I remember. Yeah, very yeah, well. yeah. Well. Um it, maybe it's unfair to ask if you, as a child, were paying, uh, had a sense of a feeling. But it, as I asked earlier, did it, did it feel, I don't know, depressed or? or... It didn't feel depressed to me. Okay, because these people had lost their businesses, and I assume they were in a position where, um, you know, uh, they can't really get the value out of their home they might have if the town was still bustling. So they're kind mm -hmm. of stuck. Well, maybe some of those people were. I would say that the women who were widows, uh, but everybody seemed contented. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel like, mm, we wish we were doing something else. Uh -huh. And, you know, the Voynichs, there was the bar, and Mary worked at the high school uh, cooking. Um, I never had the feeling that people felt deprived or downtrodden or depressed or anything like that. The, and there were these creative people, like I was telling you, the artists who live here, yeah. lived here, and people like uh, Roger Holt and Shorty Powell, who were painters, and I mean, God knows how they survived. I know Shorty Powell would have my dad work on his building, which was where I work now, High House, and um, he would, I've got paintings. He paid my dad with paintings. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. And but these are guys, this is more the beatnik invasion. Yes, it was, actually. And, uh, but not as big as, as a few years later, 10 years later, when the hippies came. No. Just a few? Just right. A oh. few kind of misfits that wanted to get away? Uh, it could, yeah. And then um, there, was, <clears throat> there was an art co-op gallery up here. Even then. Oh, yes. So where do you figure we are right now? 59, 60s, six, uh, early this, 60s? Yeah, this would be early 60s. Okay. And uh, that, that was where Laughing Mountain is now. Okay. And it was a big art gallery. And, and I know Roger spent a lot of time there. His, his paintings were there. And there were a lot of people like Don Walsh who were involved in that gallery. Who was running it at that time, do you know? Well, it, like I said, it was kind of a cooperative effort. However, what's kind of funny is they had a, what I call a figurehead for the gallery. <laughs> he lived in Sedona. His name was Cecil Lockhart Smith. Well, yes. And he always wore an ascot. <laughs> Got to play the part. And sounded very cultured. Uh. And I don't know if this was to stimulate outside interest in Jerome right. artists or not. But, but if you're going to have a figurehead, he might as well wear an ascot. Oh, yes. Speak with a slight English yes, accent, maybe. Yes, <laughs> very much so. <laughs> so that was going on even back then. Even back then. Oh, definitely. So there were enough people 
kind of coming through town to maybe support a little bit. Well, yeah, there weren't that many people, obviously. Right, right. I mean, there were very few people. There was the there was the Dutch gallery, and then there was the copper shop, which was run by Beverly and Leo Sullivan. And then there was the Shop Unusual, which was uh, run it. by uh, his nephew came in last week and asked me where that shop was. Oh, no kidding. Doug and Catherine Kell wow. who had that place. And then there, were, there was Louise Heyer had a little antique shop kind of right next to that. And then, of course, I'm sure you know Laura Williams had what she called the friendly shop, which was next to Paul and Jerry's. Yeah. So how many, what percentage of the stores were occupied, do you think? So the ones I'm just telling you about yeah, right so, now were there. But that's maybe five, seven, eight. Oh, yeah. There the were, rest of them are empty and then there was and the mine. Up. There was the Mine Museum, of course. On oh, the okay. The Mine Museum was really started by the few people who were left here. And there were people like Ruth Cantrell, who was a teacher down in, uh, in uh, she, she was my eighth grade teacher. Yeah. Uh, Geraldine Thomas, who is my sixth grade teacher. And oh, what a wonderful person she was. And, and, they, and then John McMillan. And uh, oh, who was the postmaster? Um, anyway, these people. There were just at this tiny cluster of people, like five, six, seven people. And John McMillan really did a huge amount of work on the, the Mine Museum. Okay, and they all cooperated to, to try to draw people to Jerome to make it into a tourist yeah, attraction. Yeah, the, the Voynichs told me about them, their efforts to get the um, Historical Society started. Yes. And uh, make, uh, coming up with the idea of a ghost town as a yes. way to market it. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is happening right around then too. That's wh yeah. That's yeah. when that was happening. Was about the time we moved here. Yeah. I remember a, a f someone took a photo. They put sheets over about three people, you know, and had them walking across the street, you know, t <laughs> for the ghost town <laughs> idea. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Take some pictures or just uh, random ghosts yeah. as people drive by. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and, and as I was telling you, people really believed that it was a deserted town, even though there were people living here. Did and it feel deserted to you? No. No, it was full of people <clears throat> that I knew and loved, you know? Okay. And like I said, people would walk. We're sitting in our, in our dining room, and people would walk up to our living room, and people would walk up and look in the windows and go, oh, there's someone living here. <laughs> there are creatures in there. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Well, um, I feel like I'm there right now. I remember coming up, I told you I came up to visit the, the Powder Box Church right. when I was 14, 15. Yeah. I have this distinct memory, who knows whether I recreated it or not, but I remember the sidewalks, the, the streets and the gutters filled like with dirt. And I seem to remember tumbleweeds blowing around, but could that could be. be, you know, and it, it just seemed be. deserted. Even, and this is 1970. Right. So it even felt that way to me back back then. Right. Like there were no one, li and I'm imagining that it would be a lot like that when you were, you, you were younger. Um, uh, like, I don't really remember <clears throat> the dirt and the tumbleweeds because people really did try to keep the place nice. Okay. And. And um, Ruth Cruz, who I've mentioned to you before, she and a number of other people formed this uh, organization called the Community Service Organization. And they did things like they threw bake sales and they did whatever they could. They started the home tour oh. up here uh, to raise money to do whatever repairs and spruce the place up. I remember... Um, a toilet that was planted with flowers. It's, you know, I've seen a lot of those since then, but it was the first time I'd seen that, you know, and it was something they did for one of their little events okay. that they threw. And yep. um, just this group group of people, a lot of them were the new transplants too, okay. um, who were saying, we, we want to preserve this place. We don't want it to fall apart. We want to fix things. 
Yeah, what's, uh, what's your perception of the, um, the newcomers and the feelings of the old timers as this transition's happening? Well, uh, when you ask me that question, I'm going, which wave of newcomers are you talking about? Because okay. my family was included in probably that first wave of newcomers. Right. And, and I remember mentioning the community service organization to Henry at one point, and, and he had kind of a disdainful attitude about it because, of course, his parents were here. His family was here before we arrived, and they were kind of like, well, what are these new people doing, you know, coming in and trying to change our town? And so there was a little bit of that attitude when, when that group of people that I was included in arrived. And then when uh, what we call the hippies arrived, of course, it was uh, sort of this horrified thought that these people are on drugs and they're... <laughs> And they're killers and rapists and, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the usual. Yes, the usual. You know, although I guess I was, at, I was coming of age at that time and I'm going, I don't think so. <laughs> so I, had, I do have to tell you a funny story, which I heard kind of secondhand. <clears throat> and this was about the time I went off to college. Uh, which was 1971. Okay. And people told me um, that uh, one of the council ladies up here, Inez Kelly, put a blow-up doll in her car because she was afraid she would be attacked by drug-crazed hippies. And she felt that she was safer if someone thought someone was in the car with her. I see. <laughs> so there was a little parent. Well, that's always, uh, that's a... A tribal thing. Newcomers, what, is, what are they bringing? And think of reefer madness, you know. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That's I'll, still in, imbued in our minds, in although our subconscious. Although, I don't know if any of the people I knew ever saw reefer madness. <laughs> you know, all the older people I it. knew. <laughs> but, you know, that was out there in society, certainly. Sure, sure. So, um, I'm kind of... I'm imagining that this was uh, interesting, at, at the very least, for you. Well, on that note, um, I remember having an assembly in high school where a police officer came in and burned something that was supposed to smell like marijuana, so we would know what marijuana smelled like. I remember so that. So we could be vigilant and not get involved in this subculture, this, these drug-crazed people. <laughs> And as I learned what marijuana actually smelled like, I thought, uh, that really didn't smell that much like that. <laughs> they did a poor job of learning as if they right. were trying. <laughs> so, um, well, a lot of the people that moved here were not much older than you. No, not much. So you made friends? Um, at that <clears throat> time... I actually left Jerome in 1971 because I was going to college then. Yeah. And in the summers, I was working on on Mingus at the summer camp up there at the at the Methodist camp. So I didn't spend a lot of time in Jerome in those years uh, between 1971, and then um, I got married in '74 lived in Globe until 76 and moved back. My, my ex-husband and I moved back up here about 76 to the oh, area. Okay. You couldn't stay away t very long. Well, it's... Wh where did you go to school? Uh, I went to school uh, at NAU my, my, my freshman year, and then I went to ASU for two years okay. and, and dropped out and got married because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, that sounds similar to me, although I moved to San Francisco to be a rock and roll star. Oh, but, wow. But I did go to NAU and ASU and then you dro did. dropped out. Yeah. Oh, so. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds yeah. familiar. Um, may I ask what you were studying? What you, did you think oh. you were going to do? Oh, well, I had no idea. That was the problem. Yeah. Okay. I was a good student. I, I was an honor student, but yeah, I didn't yeah. know what I was doing. Right. So at my last stab at something was I thought I'd go into nursing, but science, things like genetic genetics and uh, chemistry were not my thing. So. Okay. 
So really, you're only gone about four or five years. About five years. Yeah. Although we moved to Cottonwood. And your parents that... stayed, stayed here? My parents stayed here just through 73. Oh. Because they were not living here uh, when I got married in 74. I see. Why did they leave? Uh, well, <laughs> they moved to another little mining town up by Kingman. Uh, named Chloride. Okay. And they had they had known people who owned property up in Chloride and went up there and bought some, once again okay, very once again, cheap. Yes. You know you could buy property for nothing. So and, it was the same business plan. Yeah. Essentially yeah. for your dad. So my dad went up there and built them a house. Okay. And the reason they moved there is my mother said, when we get older, we don't want to go up and down all these stairs. We want to live somewhere flat. Okay. And I think about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Although I can't think of any other earthly reason why they would move over there. I mean, they still had the cruises up here, mm -hmm. and they still they would go back and forth and visit each other once a month over all those years. Huh. So I honestly don't know why they moved to Chloride. Yeah. It, it was another strange little mining town with, with mm. a lot of... Eccentric people, Jerome has always been a place that has attracted what I consider characters yeah. and artists. What's your theory and on that? I don't know what's going on there, but to me, it's always been like that. Hmm. Interesting. It's, yeah, it seems to be something more than just an out-of-the-way place. Yeah. To, to me. Yes, I agree with you. I have... Two theories, see what yours is. I, yes. I, I think there's something to do with the metal in the ground, because when I first moved here and I would drive up the, the, the long road up the hill here, yeah. I would always feel this weird electricity <laughs> or some, some sort of electromagnetic something. would. I don't feel it anymore, but for the first couple of months when I would come up here, mm -hmm. I'd always feel it. The other thing is I... I have the sense that people get washed up on the shores of Jerome, and I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what I mean by that, but does that stimulate any thoughts? No, I, I kind of know what you mean by that. Yeah. yeah it's, but it, it is attractive to people. I think creative people, I mean, it seems like there have always been that type of person that here. Um, there, I mean, there are other types of people here, pe business people, and you know. But it de it definitely has a vibe to it. Yeah. And I don't know what creates that. If okay. it is the metals or the <laughs> what's going on underground, or I don't know either. But it's just but it's speculation. the way it is. Trying to explain something that yes. seems ineffable, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, so let's uh, let's get back to well you're okay so you're off to college so you're 18 19 in right. 1971 right and the first wave of hippies what what people came here that you knew do you and, so, and what were they doing and what were you doing with them so one of the things I remember speaking of that particular group is uh, my dad was mayor from oh no kidding yeah he was. Let's see, he was mayor, I know he was mayor when I was in maybe 7th, 8th grade into my freshman year in high school. And one of the first people who I might consider a hippie that I remember well is uh, Ed Dowling in our living room uh, talking to my dad about what was going on and what he thought needed doing. Uh, and, uh, I interviewed Ed. <laughs> And another memory of my dad as mayor is picking up the phone and a lot of very loud screaming and cursing going on after saying hello. And I'm, I'm not very old and I'm holding the phone out like this thinking I shouldn't be listening to this person talking. And I waited until they stopped screaming and then I said, I believe you want to speak with my father. <laughs> Just a moment, okay. <laughs> wow. 
Well, I imagine there were a lot of serious, <laughs> serious problems that needed working out at that time. Oh, there were a lot of serious problems. In fact, I was just thinking about, um, I was talking to Anthony Lozano a few years ago, and he said, do you remember when they were repairing the big pipes with things like inner tubes, giant inner tubes, and, you know, strapping... Yes. Things I've, around them. He said, can you imagine that taking place in this day and age? Yeah, no, no. How, how horrible it was. And, you know, the things that were done. Now that, I know the town had no money. And we did whatever it took to keep everything functioning. Like, I remember my mother saying to my dad, if you ever run for city council again, I will divorce you. I just want you to know this. And it, that was primarily sparked by the fact that he spent one Christmas Eve trying to help the town crew of one or two people fix the water lines yeah. because they were frozen. I've heard these stories. Yeah. yeah. Well, Richard Martin told me, you know, we used to run this town with three people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I imagine a pretty high-pressure job your dad had there. I mean, <laughs> well, there wasn't a lot going on, but you know, there were still, a lot of things going wrong too. Right. Stuff falling apart. Yes, everything was falling apart. Yeah. And in that in that way, I guess you could say it was a little bit depressed. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, when something when there was an emergency like that, there wasn't a whole lot uh, to work with. Yeah. 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 What. Well, as a kid, what did you do around Jerome? Did you explore? Were you that type of child? Or? Well, they didn't let me get very far from the house, I think, because I was a little girl. Okay. I remember you know, doing things like jumping rope. I was a big reader. I remember my, my mother was always after me because instead of doing whatever it was I was supposed to be doing, I was reading. Okay. And, and I did have uh, friends from school in other towns, too, uh, in Clarkdale. And... So we would go to, I remember going to my uh, friend's house and spending all day at the Clarkdale pool. Things okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. Those were the sorts of things that we did for fun. Okay, but it seemed maybe a little dangerous with all the um, empty buildings that are falling apart for a kid yes. to be snooping around. But, they, but we did it anyway, of course. <laughs> of course. So don't go up on those, in those houses on Company Hill yeah. because, you know, they were falling apart. But I do remember going up in those houses. Sure. So th I got off the leash <laughs> here and there, you know, and, and went in there. And you had to be very careful where you stepped Sure. because there were floorboards that would give way. Um, I remember going up in the old hospital with my dad and John McMillan, which is, of course, now the Grand Hotel. But right. there were still hospital beds up there. Yeah. Um, That's creepy to think uh, about. Yeah, I guess the building did have a bit of a creepy feel. Now, when I got older, I had a boyfriend who broke into that place, and we ran around and with some of his friends and tried to scare each other. But I don't remember ever feel it. My parents told me there was no such thing as a ghost, so I never, you know, looked for ghosts or thought they existed or anything like that. Right. right. I think as an older person, there are a lot of unexplained things. Um, yeah. That not, not to get too personal, but can I ask you who your boyfriend was? And was he from Jerome? No, he wasn't from Jerome. Oh. He was from Cottonwood. He ended okay. up being my husband eventually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't want to, you know, for whatever you'd like to volunteer about that. But, um, well, okay. So you, uh, you know, knew him from childhood. Uh, actually, he and his fam he and his family were transplants from Pennsylvania, and I knew him in high school because, okay. of course, we didn't really know the kids from Cottonwood very well because we went to Clarkdale Jerome School, uh, and you know, unless you had some connection in Cottonwood, you didn't know kids from Cottonwood. Gotcha. So I didn't know the kids from Cottonwood and Sedona until I went to high school. I see. Okay, and you went to high school after the Jerome. High school? No, closed? I was up here. Oh, you did go to this yeah. high school? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, there were only 108 kids in my class that graduated in 1971. Wow. There were only about 400, a little over 400 kids in that school. And that's when the school district was consolidated and included over to where the county line runs through Sedona. 
Uh, and they bust all those kids up here. No, it closed in 72, the following, the year after you graduated. Uh, 72 is when the first class graduated from the school down below. Okay, Ming, the new Mingus High School. The new Mingus High okay. School. Okay, so they were both going at the same time. Yeah, well, at the end. So I remember we had initiation, freshman initiation, bef and as seniors where the grounds, where the high school was built, but it wasn't actually built there yet. I see, okay. What, kind of, what kind of high school was Jerome High School? Well, it was, I thought it was really fun because of course you had those big copper doors in front. Yeah, And all the buildings were active and filled. Yes, okay. yes. So you had the gymnasium, of course, Yep. Where, where the Western Heritage is, is now. And I was in band, and our band room was up those stairs oh, at the, the back. back. Yeah. And we had band and chorus up there. Where was your cafeteria? And the cafeteria uh, is, it was uh, that, that building away from, right next to the biggest main the building. Mi the middle building between Mar yeah, the Margo and Robin, right. Building B, I think yes. they call it now. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So where Alan Johnson has his studio and Vicky, right. Vicky and Daryl Day were. Right. Okay. Wow. And then they had shop, uh, the shop class was in that building on the lower level there. Okay. And where Margo and um, Robin have been for so long. What, yeah. was, what was in there? I, I had biology up there on the second floor. Uh, but I so can't remember what the what classes were held in the lower floors. Huh. And then the big building, A, was? The big building was things like uh, we had English and chemistry and math classes, typing. OK. And the library was there? I'm trying to, people always told me my studio down there was the library, but I wasn't ever sure of that. I can't remember where the <laughs> library was, and I was a big reader. Yeah. Well, they, what they, um, my studio, the building A, you know, where the plaza is, and you walk in the end of the building there, not on the back side where the uh, gymnasium is, but the, right. this side. Yeah. Uh, that first door, the middle floor, not the basement, not the upstairs, and you open it up, the first door or two on the left right past the bathroom there. That was my studio. And people always told me that that was the library, but I never knew for sure. Because there was no remnants <gasps> of a library there. Well, you, you can, well, I'm not sure if it's if it's in that you can grab this it. annual or in, or in my other one that I didn't bring. <laughs> okay. But there is a picture of a bunch of kids in the library, ah. which might give us a clue. Yeah. That was a little personal curiosity. Certainly. But uh, actually, um, you're, this is an opportunity. I haven't really talked to anybody who went to the high school, so this Aside is... Aside from Henry, who did. Yeah, that's true. Right. But uh, Henry had his own story to tell, so... Um, yeah, wow, so... So it was a vibrant school. You had sports teams. It was just like a real high school. And oh, absolutely. Even and all the kids from Cottonwood and Clarkdale came there. And Sedona. And Sedona, too. Yeah, I'll everything be in between here and there. So that was Everybody. A, a bustling place. Oh, yeah. Well, it was 400 kids. My high school in Phoenix was 400, I think. Oh, is that all? Wow. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm wrong. 400 for my class. Oh, yeah. So th yeah. Three, three times that. Right. 1,200, which is still not huge. Wow. So walk me around there. Yeah. So, well, it, no, maybe the fact that the high school was up here helped give the town some, mm. li some feeling, feeling of being of, right. lively. Yeah. That might have been part of it. I was thinking As far that. as... Uh, it's funny though, I was thinking about Jerry Voynich and, and when we were talking about how quiet it had been and he said that he could go lay in the middle of the road in front of his house for half an hour and he probably wouldn't have got run over by a car. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I know he went to that high school, but of course he was older than I was. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. so I don't know. 
Um, what do you want to know about the high school? I don't school? know. I guess you have. I'm 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 projecting a little bit because I'm thinking okay. about about my high school in Phoenix, and wondering how different if it seemed ancient up here or did it well, seem the modern? Build, like the building didn't seem modern to us. Right. <clears throat> but the. But I think that we embraced that. I think we enjoyed that feel. I did, but you know, I had grown up here and. To me, I still prefer older buildings. I think they have more personality. A new building is kind of... Soulless. Yes, yeah. that's the word right there. Yeah. And, you know, in spite of the fact that my dad uh, wrestled with these buildings that were falling apart. Right. And, you know, all the problems that uh, come with an older building. Yeah. He said it's so much easier to build something new than to try to fix something that's old. <laughs> Yeah, we all know that experience. Yes. <laughs> here. Don't open anything Very up. Much. You never know oh. what you're gonna find. <laughs> it's gonna lead to five more problems. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I'm just uh, taking a trip uh, through time thinking about being a high school kid at the Jerome High School because my experience is having an art studio there. Right. You know, I don't hear they have the pictures of the kids on sure. the walls. Sure. But there's no. Uh, uh, the sound of you know. In, oh in well, you know, classes. there's the metal lockers that that were lining the halls there that everybody was slamming their lockers. Right, and, you know, downstairs. it's like uh -huh. I think any other high school certainly. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, now, did you guys have a football field? The football field was in Clarkdale. Oh. Bright field. Oh, okay, but you did have basketball up. Yeah, oh yeah, gym. well the gymnasium was yeah. state of the art. It, it looks... It, it was I, considered... I wish it was still in operation, it's a wonderful space. Yeah. And then you also had a stage at the yes. end of it too, so it was double function. Well actually anything that we, we did that you had to have a stage for was in the old high school building in building A. Oh. So if, if we had band concerts or theater productions, those were all done in that auditorium. Not in, not in the gym? No, not in the gym. That was basketball. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, down across from where Don Bassett was, down on the bottom floor. Yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, and that's where they burned the stuff that was supposed to smell like marijuana. <laughs> That's where we'd have our assemblies. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, okay. I, there was a joke there. I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll think of it later. <laughs> wow. Well, any other thoughts about the high school before we... Uh, well, one, one of my uh, teachers was somebody you might consider a hippie. So I think when I was in his company was probably the first time I actually did smell marijuana and it was because we were going by somebody's house that he knew and <laughs> I have no doubt that he probably uh, smoked a little himself but it's interesting to see the annual that we put together I was on the annual staff that year and we did some things that probably were new and interesting because Ed Cooper was our annual teacher okay. and he did things that were definitely outside the box. Names were not in alphabetical order in the classes, which they had always been. Our, I, I can show you this in the annual too. And our page for uh, annual staff, annual was down in the basement in, in building A and there was an old picture of Teddy Roosevelt down there and I think we put a donut on top of it and autographed it. Everybody wrote their name and and, and their astrological sign, of course, <laughs> under their name. <laughs> of course. Well, did you feel yourself um, swept up by the zeitgeist of the times? Um, That's a roundabout way of asking a lot of 
different things. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, well, definitely I did not get involved in drugs at that point. I mean, I definitely smoked some dope when I was in college. Yeah. But not, not at that juncture. Me too, audience. <laughs> 50 years from now, this will seem quite quaint, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I think when I got a little older, because I just wasn't old enough at that time when I lived in Jerome, and I was also a goody two-shoes. Okay. Uh, you know, just really straight-laced. All righty. Uh, but... Well, Iowa... Yes, there's Runs that. Deep. Yeah, it does very much so, even to this day. <laughs> of course, we can't get away as hard as we try. Right. So, uh, yeah, um, I would say that the people were moving into town were intriguing. Um, I don't know that I knew any of them really all that well. Now, Fern, who I know you've heard her name mentioned as one of that group of people, was one of our substitute teachers when I was in high school. Uh, and, and we're going, yeah, these people are kind of different. <laughs> um, I think there was a little bit of the fear that, that you know, these are druggies. Right. Um, but also, uh, yes, but also at... at that particular age that I was at, you you get curious about that. I, I would say I wasn't, while I lived here, I was not involved in what was going on, but I knew, it, I knew something was happening. It was a new wave coming in. Yeah, so you, what'd you think of, I mean, as from the stories I've heard, uh, there's potlucks going on uh, everywhere. There's music now happening a lot oh, yes. at the spirit room. Um, did that seem um, uh, music man like? Uh, you know that rhymes with pool and <laughs> the, the, there was sins. <laughs> Trouble coming. right here Trouble, in yes, River City. Rhymes with feet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right here in River City. Um. I don't know that I really felt that much of it. Maybe a, a little tinge of that. Okay. Um, what I remember is, is things like uh, Walter Powell had the, in the summertime these little musical gatherings at his place. He had a friend who was a professor of music at U of A. Uh, Brandon Smith was his name. And so on a particular given night, I can't remember which, she would tell the people in town, we're gonna to have a, a music night. And everybody would bring lawn chairs or whatever and sit out on the sidewalk where I work. And um, even out into the street, you know, because there wasn't that much traffic. And um, Brandon Smith would play us concerts. On, and he played what guitar? Well, no, he, just on a on a record player. Oh, all sorts of different music because he was a professor of music. Ah, and that was one of one of the things that went on in Jerome. How many people showed up for that? Oh, I'm gonna say maybe anywhere from a dozen to twenty or something like that. Very cool. Yeah. He set up a phonograph on speakers and yeah, he'd, exactly. Would right he introduce on the sidewalk. it and tell you about it? Right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds like something we should do Nowadays. today. Nowadays, yes. Yeah, yes. well, if you remember, well, you probably remember when I came early in ninety, early 90s, uh, for a while we had the movies out at, yes. on a big sheet. Yes. That was fun. Yeah. We don't seem to do that. Much no, anymore. we don't do that much yeah. anymore. But I do so, remember that. Well, tell me, um, is there anything from before you left to go off to college, anything from that childhood era that you want to mention that I might not think to ask before we move to the few more current? Um, well, I, I will mention that I worked at House of Joy when I was in high school. Oh, okay. I, uh, they had just opened up um, in 67. And this was John and John and Mary. And Mary. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, my parents let me go to, on a European tour, uh, and use some of my college fund that they had saved, and so they said, you know, if, if you want to get a little job, and I don't, I think John and Mary maybe approached my parents because I was 
an age that was appropriate to be a bus girl. Right. And so I would, uh, they weren't open a lot, so you know, it wasn't a lot of hours. But I, I worked up there when they first opened. Uh -huh. And then I, when I came back. Uh, when did they first open? It was, I believe it was 67. 67. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and then after I came back, I had been here a couple of years and had been waitressing in Cottonwood. And John walked into the place where I was working and said to the owner, Chuck, I'm taking your waitress. <laughs> <laughs> so that so was that's my... that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was my second time working up there. But that was something that revitalized Jerome, too, because... They attracted people from all over the place. They became very well known, and they were just open on the weekends. They were open Saturday and Sunday, but we had people from Phoenix. We had people from out of state, and though it was small, we were always packed. We were reservations only. Yeah. Although the early years were not like that. Okay. Yeah, I remember I told you my family would come up and everybody talked about the House of Joy and how hard it was to to get a reservation. Sure. You well, had to do it months in advance. Well, I don't know if it was, you know, but certainly that mystique was created. Yeah. Because it was small and they were only open for a limited amount of time, it did make it more yeah. difficult. Was the food that good? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> And did you want to move forward into the future? I, uh, well, um, I only I asked that because I uh, was running out of uh, questions. Okay. And um, who knows how well I covered it or interrogated. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that yeah. um, there weren't some things you had recollected in the last oh. in the last couple of weeks after we you know, since we talked about doing sure. this. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are so many things I'm missing, you know. Yeah. And I'll think of them in the after next... After you go. Yeah, yeah, after I go, but... <laughs> well, during the rest of our conversation, if right. you do and you want to go back sure. and fill in, that's perfectly okay. fine. There's no uh, hard, fast rules. Um, so, you moved away for five, six years. Right. And... Uh, couldn't get away, obviously. So what happened is uh, my husband was working in the mines in Globe, and we decided that we didn't want to live like that forever. And his sister was getting married in Pennsylvania, and we said, well, let's go to Jane's wedding, and we'll drive across the United States to Pennsylvania from Arizona. We hit the coast of California and went across that way, and then we'll go back through the south, or, you know, we were, we were, it was open-ended. We were looking for a place to live, somewhere else, something else to do. And uh, we saw a lot of great places. Uh, I thought the California coast was pretty nice. And we got back to Pennsylvania and started running out of money, kind of, at that point. And came back, his parents were living in Cottonwood, and we actually came back and lived with his parents. We hadn't found any place that captured our interests that much, and so we were perfectly happy to come back to the Verde Valley. Huh. And uh, no thought of coming up to Jerome? Did that cross your mind? Um, well, Jerome always seemed like home to me, but uh, I didn't have the means to buy a house up here. and. Actually, my ex-husband and his family had horses, and um, they had a property um, outside of Cottonwood, outside of where Verde Villages are now, okay. and where they kept horses. Yeah. So that was really the better place for us to live. Right. Yeah. Well, you have a uh, you blended family, so yeah, that makes. Did you? Um, uh, so, what was your relationship with Jerome at that point? Well, I, ha I still had Ruth Cruz up here and her mother. They were still up here. There were still a lot of people. Like, well, Mar Marguerite Cambrusi and her husband were, were friends, although he had passed away many years ago. Okay. But she was still up here. I still knew a lot of people. 
So I would uh, come up to see Ruth, and my parents were still coming over to visit the cruises. So when my parents would come to town, of course, I'd be up here with them. Yeah. So, um, so this is late 70s? Right. This is, this is 70, 76, 77, 78. And what are you seeing happening in town? Well, there were people who had started businesses who were considered the hippie group. I mean, you know, Jane Moore was doing her pottery mm -hmm. and uh, with Dave Hall. And Tracy. Weisel and Tracy and, and uh, Carol, who Carol. has recently yep. moved back. Mm -hmm. She's on my list. Yeah. Uh, they, they were here and had businesses. And there was the schoolhouse that was open at that time. Mm -hmm. And there were the shops up there and the restaurant. Oh, well, that's right, and the disco. And the disco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even my mom went to the disco. Yes. Yeah, tell me about that. Did you come up and hang and Oh, party? A, little a little bit. <laughs> I was not into disco. <laughs> But, you know, it was a happening thing in That's Jerome. Right. <laughs> the raves of its day. Yeah. I remember David Santian being the DJ up there. I never heard of him. Oh, you don't know the Santians? Mm -mm. Oh, my goodness. Well, the Sa I went to school with the Santian kids. Okay. And uh, they, were, they lived in the Gulch. And most of them are gone, actually. A lot of them died young. Hmm. Yeah, but David was the cousin of the siblings that I went to school with, and he was up there at the dis at the disco. Yeah. And. Um, and then there was the the library. Was the library the was was the restaurant. Yeah. And there was a there was the little bar there that had chalkboards for the counter. <laughs> yep. S uh, slate. That yeah. you could draw with chalk. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. My, my mom's favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was really fun to go. I, I'm i not a big drinker, and I really don't like bars very much, but I do remember going in there one day and drinking too much beer and having a hell of a time, you know, <laughs> drawing stuff on the chalkboard. <laughs> that seemed to be a, a, an attraction. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I know Karen Letcher and her sister uh, had a shop up there. Karen uh, lives up here. Okay. And they had a little shop. So Jerome's waking up? Jerome was definitely waking up then. And there were a lot more businesses. Yeah. And a lot of, and th there were a lot of people who were considered hippies that were involved in the businesses. Yeah. Yeah, now they're landowners. <laughs> yes, yes, those rebels became the establishment. Yes, yes they did. They gentrified themselves. <laughs> well, you know, a guy has to eat. It's a, syndro a syndrome self-gentrification. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about these well, gyrations? Like, like I said, you know, they had to eat too. They yeah, had to yeah, find yeah. a way to survive. Sure. And so... Uh, they created businesses, yeah, and, and it helped. And it helped revitalize the town. Certainly. Yeah. Did you notice that things were seemed to be? Well, did you I, take note that it was growing and getting more? Oh yeah. Popular. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 Which I mean, was like a yay, yay for Jerome kind of feeling. I think so. Yeah, yeah. I I think so because. Because definitely the town needed that prosperity mm -hmm. uh, with things crumbling from so many years, yep. you know, and, and hopefully things were, were becoming a little more prosperous and maybe the town was going to survive a little bit better that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do remember a lot of the buildings on Hull being boarded up and, and in, now there were shops opening there. Right. I mean, yeah. Shorty Powell always had High House there, but that was that was quite a place. He had thirty cats, and he had antiques, and he had opals, and I, mean, I assume it was called High House for a reason. <laughs> well, if Shorty got high, I don't think it was marijuana. <laughs> he might maybe. 
<laughs> but as you say, that was more of the beatnik t generation. Oh, okay. Okay. I remember the first time I ever saw somebody spit on a rock or lick a rock, it was Shorty Powell, and he was showing me what it would look like if it was if polished. It, right. Yeah. And, you know, he was into the, into the gemstones. Yes. <laughs> But his was probably the first shop I remember on that street. So did you work up here in Jerome, even though you lived down? I worked at the House of Joy from uh, 78 on oh. until it closed. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, so you worked before as a bus girl when you were young. In high school. And then you went back to it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Now, why was, um, was it Mary or John who was the expert cook? Oh, it was John. Yeah? Yeah. And he, he had a long history of that? or Yes. He seemed uh, a bit autodidactic. I wondered if he, uh, I often wondered whether he had uh, education or some a stint in France or something where well, he learned to do this. he learned cooking at home. No kidding. Yes, he did. And obviously there were some very talented people in his family where, as far as that went. Uh, he was he was raised on a ranch in California, and when he was very young, very young, like eight nine years old, uh, he was out making things in Dutch ovens in the ground. Ah, so he had an affinity for cooking from an early age. Yeah, he was taught these things uh -huh. by his family when uh -huh. he was very young. I'm, I think that. I know he, he worked at a place called Doro's in San Francisco, which was a very exclusive restaurant there. Hmm. And I'm not sure where, where he picked up any skills in between his childhood and that particular uh, job. Right. Was he a typical tyrannical chef? They have a reputation. You know. Yes, well, <laughs> he... <laughs> He always said, I'm a cook, because uh, if you're a chef, you have people working under you. Uh, and he this was, is a one-man job. was a one-man band. Yeah. I don't know how in the world anybody did that, but I mean. How many, how many tables tonight when you're open? Um, so there were f seven tables maximum. Ah. Uh. A couple of them were large, but m most of them not so. Was it done... Uh, with courses? Uh, yes, yes, oh. yes, you would have uh, bread and soup. Do you mind fall. telling me a little bit about this? Because no, I at didn't all. get to talk to John as I explained earlier. Oh, he, no, yeah, Bre please. bread and soup was the first course, and then you, would, uh, then you would have salad and muffins, and then you would have your main course, and uh, that would be your entree in a twice baked potato. Okay, what sort of things would he cook as the main course? Oh, uh, he did a lot of, he did Cornish game hens. There were uh, three different kinds of Cornish game hens. And um, there, were, there were different veal dishes, veal marsala, and what you would call a piccata, <clears throat> and a cordon bleu. Um, there were some seafood, he, oh, the best lobster tails, Australian lobster tails, and I can't have a, lobster tail anywhere else. I'm oh. not kidding you. It's just disappointing. I see. Uh, shrimp tempura. And these were always on the menu? Always on the menu. Oh. He had a very big menu. Uh -huh. And something called the Monterey kebab with different seafood, including mahi-mahi and shrimp and, um, oh, and crab imperial. Wow. Oh. He did that was seafood wonderful. well here in Arizona. Yeah. That's not easy to do. No, no. And, you know, <laughs> if people were snobbish, they would say, well, you know, how do you get... Well, we don't have it flown into Jerome, I can tell you that. You have to buy it frozen and thought because you can't buy fresh seafood in Jerome. No, you can't. At least... But... <laughs> <laughs> Not in this millennium. No. A couple million years ago, yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, when the sea was down yeah. <laughs> right there. <laughs> and and we had lamb, and uh, he tried steaks for a while, but it, it, people would order well-done steaks, and that you yeah, know, that were like a salt. ton of bricks, yeah, so yeah, yeah, we yeah. took that off. <laughs> now, were you uh, dressed up? Um, was it formal? 
it, no, it wasn't particularly formal for us. We had to wear practical clothing, you know, okay. aprons and such. Uh, but but since it was kind of a place for ha people to have anniversaries or birthdays or special things like that, uh, because it was more expensive than just your average restaurant, uh, people came for special occasions, they would dress up. Yeah. And um, John and Mary certainly had brought the bohemian charm that they had with them, and that was all over in the restaurant. Okay. And both of them being artists. Yeah. I mean, it, they, it always kind of looked like it had a bordello-ish atmosphere. Well, uh, and it yes. was called the House of Joy. What what happened there was they, they were very good friends with Dr. Bright. And Dr. Bright was very good friends with Barry Goldwater. So uh, one day as they're fixing the place up to open it, um, Dr. Bright's walking down the street with Barry Goldwater and says to them, yeah, this used to be one of the best hook joints up here because they were looking for a name. And then, aha! House of Joy. Thanks for that story. Certainly. That's a good one. Yeah. So that's definitely one of the businesses that helped Jerome prosper. Yeah. Oh, it was infamous. I, I told you I would hear about it all the time. Now, all the uh, all the the uh, designers and clients in Scottsdale, you know, interior design clients and yeah. wealthy people, everyone knew about the House of Joy. Yes. Yeah. So you did pretty good there as a waiter? As a waiter? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. But you, you worked there when you came back and you worked till it closed. Yes. Holy cow. Until John so had his accident. That was your only job? That was my only yeah. job. And did it stay only two nights a week, uh, yes. weekends, for all that time? Yes. Wow. Wow. Was it fun? It was fun because we had that clientele that was kind of special, you know. Okay. Interestingly enough, I still have people who come in and find me at the candy store. And remember? And Yeah. They, because they know I work there and they'll come across and these are people that I waited on for years. Wow. I mean, we really developed a lot of friendships <clears throat> with people. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Holy cow. Now Mary worked there too? She well, she had, she was the hostess. She was the hostess. And the and the waitress. I was still always the bus girl. Okay. <laughs> were the, just you for seven tables? Yeah, Mary and I were, oh, were the okay. ones who waited on tables, and oh John had God. a dishwasher. Wow. That was it. It was a four-person operation. Holy cow. And uh, Well, for two so, days a week, you worked your butt Yes. We, yeah. Well, John and Mary worked very hard. The rest of us worked hard enough, but they really, yeah. I mean, two days was enough to make anybody fall over. Yeah. And Henry was one of their dishwashers. I don't know if he told you that. And then Linda Heidenreich wa was one of their dishwashers for years and years. Uh -huh. And uh, John McDonald, who lives yeah. up here, was uh, was one of their dishwashers for years. Now, um, I was wondering about John real quick. How long has he has he been here? That um, long, or he he just worked at the House of Joy for those. I don't I don't know his history before he worked at House of Joy because uh, oh. I worked, but I worked with him for a number of years. And when did it close, Sue? Uh, it was in uh, ninety nine. Uh, okay. It was November of ninety nine. John had his bicycling accident, broke his hip. That's right. They told him he'd never walk again. Two weeks later, he was walking. And, and went on to ride his bike. And went on to ride his bike for many years. But the, but the doctor said, okay, you surprised us. You are walking, but you will not be able to be on your feet all those hours that you spent working at the restaurant. You can't do that. Yeah. So they reinvented the place as a shop. Gotcha. And you had to move on. Well, I worked for them in their shop. Oh, easy enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going into retail, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Same business, different, different product. Yeah. I see. So, uh, um, so you're really seeing Jerome change in the '80s, '90s. What are your thoughts about that? 
fact. Well, like I said, I, I was glad to see it uh, coming to life that way. Did it happen? Has it? Did it happen in a way you expected? Maybe a bit of ex of seeing how it would evolve, and then some surprises too, as to what's how its character has been molded in the last twenty years. Well, it, that's a little not so clear question. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> I I would say that um, maybe. Maybe it wasn't so surprising. Um, it it was it was a good thing to see happening, because of course we can't see the future and don't know what to expect. But uh, yeah, maybe it was a little bit surprising to see it come to to life. Certainly to the point that it has now. Yeah. Oh, another thing that brought people up here was uh, the Jerome State Historic Park, which kind of had a big impact. Yes. And brought people up here, and and um, when did that open? The, so I where the mansion is. I re I remember that happening um, about when I would would have been in seventh grade. Oh, so it's been uh, open a long time. Yeah, yeah. I remember I, I <laughs> the first uh, the first person who was in charge over there, Robert Ladd passed away when I was maybe a freshman in high school and it was the fu first funeral I had been to and my parents were out of town so I went as a representative of the family as a young girl so it would have been uh, 60 they started working on it in the mid 60s as I remember my, my dad and Bill Cruz worked on the building because they were the guys yeah. up here and, and your dad's name again? Levi Small. Levi, okay. Yeah. And um, I remember walking into that building when they were first working on it, and you could see that it, it had been a grand mansion. And there was a big staircase that they had to do away with when they turned it into the state park. And I remember coming down this broad staircase, and there was a, uh, on this end, a huge fireplace and you had this beautiful view out of all of the windows off of that room and imagining myself as a wealthy person or a person of note coming down these stairs into this grand room and thinking well it's a shame they have to change this but it was also a good thing for the town in that you know they were able to preserve the history yeah. and share it. And it was an additional attraction. Yes, and it and was an additional. And that helps the restaurants and etc. Everything. So you yes. saw people prospering essentially. Yeah. 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 So all that was starting to come together as I was going into high school, and then after I left the area was when it probably really started picking up a little bit more. So it changed a little bit in the five years you were gone. It did. It yeah. did. When I look at the pictures of that, of Hull Avenue, in the year that I graduated from high school, I just think, wow, it was really dead. Changed from Except black and white house. to color. <laughs> yeah. There was House of Joy and there was the High House, and that was pretty much it there. Yeah. Yeah. And now, yeah, look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, do you, uh, every, you've been here longer than, you know, some of the hippie invasion foot soldiers that I've interviewed. Yeah. Um, do you think Jerome's keeping its character that it had when you were a kid? To a certain degree. I, I worry about wealth moving in here and changing it into Disneyland, but I think a lot of people who are from here have been concerned that that might happen. And put their foot down. Uh, well, I think that certainly they have. There has been a resistance to that sort of thing. More than most communities, I yes. think. That's always yes. been my impression. Yes, I would yeah. say that too. Yeah, we're not having that. We're not going to Disney. ourselves. Don't you ourselves. do that to this yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We want to fix things, but we don't want to change them to the point they lose their charm or are unrecognizable. Yeah, and we don't want it to be fake. Oh. 
Yeah, we don't want a yes. facade. No, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. What about the people? How do you see any continuity? Well, as, as I've told you, I think Jerome's always attracted eccentrics, artists, you know, people who are probably not Joe Schmo. Although I think every person has an interesting story. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask you? I had a question on the tip of my tongue. It's getting more expensive to live Can here. Can you believe? That's what, I, that's, that seems to me to be the biggest threat to having the free, yes, freer lifestyle, artistic musician, yes, jeweler, whatever, being able to put because down roots here. It's hard to afford a place to live. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. What are we going to do about that? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of getting uh, to the to the here and now, and I'm worried that I might have. Um, um, I mean, I'm a decent question asker. Yeah. But uh, what have I forgotten? What have I neglected <laughs> to ask you about? I I I don't know. Um, of course. I think that uh, I, I fought paid parking for a long time. Did you? And I realized that they need the money to fix things. I understand this. Yeah. Uh, but I, I still don't, I'm still not crazy about it. I'm kind of the same way. I, I, I real, it makes financial sense. Uh, it's just the idea that irked yes. me a little yes. bit. Yes. But uh, visually, it's not that. Yeah. Uh, uh, offensive. It's the idea that we're not standing here with open arms saying, welcome to Jerome. Right. Come explore, we're do in, whatever, in a free feeling Yeah, atmosphere. instead of a cover charge or something. Uh, yeah. Admission fee to an amusement park. Yes. Yeah. That, yeah. I think that bothered me probably more than anything. I understand the practical application. Yeah, I think for me, same thing. It was but a psychological adjustment. I'm torn, <laughs> really torn about that. Right. Well, let's hope the money goes where it's needed. Yeah, yes. Very well stated. <laughs> yes. So uh, what's your... Um, What's your opinion of the folks who visit here? How do you read them? Well, I, en I enjoy seeing them having a wonderful time and seeing, you know, everybody stands there and looks at the view and says, it's so beautiful. It's fantastic. So it's nice to see people uh, enjoying what we like about the place. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, and we do get people from all over, and people from all over are attracted to this place. There are people who, who say, I feel at home here. I feel embraced here. I, I feel happy here. And I think that still happens to people. Like uh, so many people who live in Jerome, they just showed up and said, oh, this is it. And people, but you know, not everyone can live here anymore. Yeah. As you said, it's it's limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have trouble. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right now, I couldn't afford anything up here, yeah. and I don't have my dad's skills to keep anything standing up here either, right, or right. to fix it up the way that it needs to be. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, you know. Yeah. So. Um, what? That's interesting. That not so not only. What you just described seems uh, separate and above just the mining ghost town attraction. It's they they're seeing the deeper, the essence or the quality uh, yeah. of life as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They see the beauty, but they also <clears throat> they also like to see the old buildings too. This is attractive to people. Yeah. It's a rare occurrence, and especially in Western uh, United yes. States. Yes. Yeah. I mean, because certainly 
there were a lot of things that were not well built. <laughs> Quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah, most of those are gone. Yeah, there's a lot that went away. I mean, and you've seen the pictures of them moving houses out of town on flatbed trucks. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, where did they get those houses from unless it was down on the lower levels where the houses went away after, after the yeah. mines did, went away? So you didn't see any of that happening when you were a kid? Uh... I don't that. really remember that. Yeah, no, I yeah. don't remember that happening so much. Oh. That happened, I think, before. And I remember going down to those levels with John McMillan because he was uh, <clears throat> in charge of the property, the Phelps Dodge property up here, and going with my dad and he down to some of the places where you'd see all the foundations of where the buildings had been, where all these people lived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think someone else told me about this uh, somewhere in Flagstaff, somewhere maybe in Williams, maybe Prescott, and then a c couple other places. But that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I knew a lot of not a lot of places fell down. One night I'm working at House of Joy, and there was a house next door to it. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> the the family of the people who had owned it had inherited it and never came back and did anything to the building. So we're serving one night. And we hear this boom, you know, and the ground shakes. <laughs> Everyone goes and looks out the window, and the top floor has collapsed <laughs> from neglect. <laughs> My holy cow. This is, this is an exciting restaurant, <laughs> Marsh. <laughs> Yeah, I remember these two little ladies sitting at this booth in the back, and they're going, "Look at that! Well, well, you look <laughs> we're, at we're, that. All, we're all standing here looking D at the dinner window. and a demo." <laughs> and this building that had just fallen down. Wow, I had never heard that story. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> ah, well, I don't know, Sue. I'm. In um, rich town, poor town. You know the cover on that book. Yes. That was actually the, the house that Roberto Rabago lived in. Oh, no kidding. Did you want to, maybe that's what we should do. Do you want to, would you like to share a couple of things? I've never, this is a new idea. I thought I would have to oh. um, scan things, oh. but you know what? You I'm could hold some stuff up and I'm we could talk to about it. Here. Oh, oh, here. Shall I just? Uh, I can get it. Hold on. Oh, you know what? If, if. I just need to grab that bag that's yeah. over there. <laughs> Let me do that. This one? Yes. Okay. And so... Yeah, let's do that. Stumbled upon a brilliant idea. Well, I don't know how brilliant it is, but it's at least <clears throat> semi-relevant. Um, so... Oh, it's noon. Well, almost. So this is... We've talked for a while. This is my Hour and a half. annual teacher, Ed Cooper. Let's see if we can... Uh, uh, with the Volkswagen? With the Volkswagen. Here, hold it up. Uh, hold on a second. I'm going to lower this down a little bit. Okay. For this part of the presentation. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay, cool. And where is he walking off to? Is that out Perkinsville Road or I'm something? I'm not sure exactly what that location is, but you know, this this demonstrates how unusual it probably was as a high school uh -huh. now, what yearbook. Book, what, oh, this is your yearbook from the Jerome Hunt. 1970-71, and of course there's the copper doors. Yeah, what's high-low of yesterday? Is that, oh, that an inside was... joke? <laughs> <laughs> No, it had nothing to do with marijuana. <laughs> High Low had been um, the name of the annual, and I think it referred to the fact that it was up on the hill, and a lot of the kids came from oh, the valley. Oh, okay, so, so the kids from up on high, and, and yeah, I, I get think it. that's where they got that huh. from. Interesting. So, show me your picture. <laughs> oh, well, I have. Actually, easiest to see oh, is, look this, at you. is this, uh, can you see that? I can. I'm going to zoom in. Okay. 
Oops. And that's my senior picture from 1971. Look at you. <laughs> yeah. Wow, thanks. Just well, this is fun. I've never done that. A I'm young, gonna, I'm a gonna young have... whippersnapper. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and, and I'll show you some of the, we did the pictures of the class officers. Oh, I, I do love this photo that was taken of the high school, and that's taken. Yeah, just kind of, yeah. I, I don't mean to block your face, but no, if that's you put okay. it right in front, I can see it. Yeah. This, because, so that's taken from uh, the little daisy. No kidding. Yeah. That's taken through one of the arches over at the Little Daisy. Yeah, all overgrown. Yeah, thank you. Sure. And then, um, I mean, so that's a little bit unusual for an annual page. Uh, yeah, pretty arty. Oh, yes. So this was Ed, Ed Cooper's influence on us. Oh, the Oh, you were telling me earlier yeah. that he uh, broke a lot of the rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in an old mining town to have uh, interesting photography is atypical. It is atypical. And, and so the pictures of the class officers were taken on buildings. Oh, this up is here. up on Company Hill. Yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. Terrific. What was his name and again? Ed, Ed Cooper. Ed Cooper. Way to this go, Ed. This woman is my next door neighbor in Cottonwood. <laughs> she was also one of my closest friends in high school. And just because these photos are taken up here, I think they're of, of interest to the topic. And <clears throat> this picture was taken. Um, at the Crosby's house that my parents used to own. Oh, yeah, I recognize the wall. Yeah. I'll be damned. Look at those kids. It was cold, you can tell. Uh -huh. <laughs> but there's some hippie, uh, hippie long hair going on at Jerome High School. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Linda Allen was from Jerome. She's in that photo. There are... The other kids, I mean, one of them was, uh, his dad worked at the cement plant, and then there was a preacher's kid, and then there was a very uh, staunch Mormon girl there, and, you know, so a real mixture. I think that happens anywhere, though, but interesting mixtures of people. Um, so, and here's the freshman picture, and that was taken at the, I, I can't remember exactly where that was taken, but some of those pictures are from the initiation that we held on the grounds of the new high school. Oh, okay, okay. Freshman. I miss the sophomores. Oh, and I think, and this was up at one of the high school buildings. Oh, yeah. This was at Building oh. B. Mm hmm. Back in the little uh, yard area, it looks like. Maybe. Uh, it's kind of where the parking lot is. Ah. Uh. Oh, oh, okay. Gotcha. I think, yeah. yeah. And. Oh, and also. Oh, I want to do this quickly because I don't want to waste your time. Oh, you're film. not wasting my time. This but is... uh, there, there were prom pictures taken at the cemetery. <laughs> I know. The ghost theme continues. Well, it was, it was more just that, you know, we should take advantage of the backdrops that we had. in Jerome. Oh, so this one, this building um, is uh, next to the Methodist Church. Really? The old, what do they call that? The old bakery? Oh, yeah. Well, that's torn down now. Yeah. Is that behind where a great driver lives? Yeah. yeah. It would have been, yeah. Yeah. Right there. 
but I would love to find those those pictures. Oh, here they are. Oh, it was homecoming. Homecoming. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So there was King and Queen, Ken Fitz and Esther Ontiveros. Uh-huh. Nice handsome couples. Yeah. Huh. Ken was from Sedona. He still lives around here. Esther doesn't anymore. And there's a Mongini here, and you know, that's one of the old families from yes. the area. But I think those are all the really Jerome pictures. Oh, there's the library, but it doesn't tell me which room it was in. Let me see. <clears throat> oh, we can't tell. From yeah, there, you can really you? can't okay. tell. Yeah, and I, I think it was the 1970 uh, annual that I was thinking of. But it's, it's interesting, one of the posters in the library looks very much 70s and like it might have been drug influenced or something. <laughs> Flower power. Yeah. And, you know, oh, odd pictures heck? like that, you know, in a high school annual has nothing to do with the, with the yeah, high school or anything. Mine wasn't like that, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, I know. I wanted to find the page with the annual staff if I could real quickly. But, you know, keep asking me questions if you would like. Well, oh, here it is. Here's the picture of Teddy Roosevelt and all the kids and all their astrology signs. And that was our annual staff. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> so you can see the influence there. Uh-huh. Getting away from very structured and yes. organized to kind of free-flowing. Yeah. Oh, look at these other pictures over here. Wow. I, I'm imagining it was a great place to go to high school. Oh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was fun. Oh, yeah, and that was fresh, freshman initiation, definitely. Oh, there was a, tri a trials and tribulations. <laughs> <laughs> they had to walk uh, five miles without any water or something through the desert. Oh, let's see. Well, you um, said initiation. Yes, I can't remember what we did to those kids. I don't think it was <laughs> as bad as my initiation. So let me tell you about my freshman initiation okay. up here. So there used to be an M painted up above the gulch. You would start going out the out the road there, okay. And where, there's uh, some tailings up there, mm -hmm. and there used to be an M painted up there, just like the J is over here. Okay. And we would uh, we went up there, and it was these buckets. It was a bucket brigade and brooms, and we would paint it with brooms. And the freshman class was made. To, to wear strange things. Like we had to wear pajamas and we had to wear a necklace of garlic and burnt toast. And we had to do something with our hair too. I remember mine being in some sort of pigtails or something sticking up <laughs> with this garlic and burnt toast necklace and the pajamas. And then we, we walked up most of the way up the road to paint that M. I see. And that was freshman initiation. Wow. Any s alien sightings? <laughs> no alien sightings. I'm sorry. I have not seen any aliens. Um, I, and I don't want to waste your... No, oh, that's okay. okay. We're okay, just so talking about stuff. One night I'm, I'm driving down from Jerome, and this is not that long ago, not that many years ago, and I'm, I'm looking, I had a cell phone, so you know it's fairly recent. I'm talking to my cousin on, on my phone. And I look over, I'm almost down at the S curves at the bottom, and I'm going, is that a flying saucer? There are lights going back and forth, and it's pretty broad, and it looks like it should be above the horizon. I said, Beth, I'm seeing the mothership. <laughs> the next night I'm driving down and I realize, it's a little early, I realize it's just the airport lights of Sedona. 
I was so disappointed. I was so sure I had seen. Because then you get to a certain point and it disappears because the mountain comes in between. Right. And I'm but seeing this tell. and it goes away and I'm going, yeah. oh, finally. Very funny. <laughs> um, well, there, there was a lot of UFO talk when I first got here. Yeah. But um, with some of the other... Uh, painters and artists around here. Yeah. Any, anything else you want to share? No, I was just, I was going to, well, you've seen, I don't know if you want to see this picture of the Hotel Jerome, where the artist co-op is now. Oh, yeah. It's a good one. And that that was just empty space that was used by my parents and their friends. Yeah, wow. Things have changed. Yeah. Okay. So there was that one I was going to show you. Well, um... Oh, here's something kind of fun. The Jerome Elks Lodge with uh, my my dad and Henry Vincent's... Oh, no kidding. Dad. Uh, down a little bit, Sue, if you could. Uh, right there? Yeah, that's good. Okay, and huh. I have I have one more photo that I really should share with Jerome you. Jerome Chapter Elks Lodge? Yeah, it was down in Clarkdale where, it's, okay, where it's it is still, today. Yeah, yeah, but it was still. So and what's this, one? this is a fundraiser that another one of the fundraisers that was put on um, in Jerome to preserve things. These people are all connected with Jerome or lived in Jerome. So. Do you know who they are? Yes, I can tell you who they are, but of course I'm holding the picture up, so ah, uh, it's hard for me to. I know. Is it okay if I stand and yeah, just sure. point? Yeah, mm sure. -hmm. So this is Melanie Gemmel. Her father was one of the. Whoops. Let me get. Uh, okay. Okay. Her father was involved in the later mining operations that were just a handful of people. Okay. And Linda Allen, whose parents lived up here, I believe they owned the spirit room at one point. This is Bernadette Selna. This is her sister, Barbara Selna. This is Susan Sullivan, who was the daughter of Leo Sullivan. This is uh, Carietta White, whose mother was a school teacher and lived on Center Street. Her grandparents were the Hyatts who are the hires, I'm sorry, who had the uh, antique store on, in Jerome okay. from the early days. And this is me. And that's you. I thought that was you. Some handsome women in Jerome. Well, <laughs> we, were, we were modeling uh, clothes from earlier years. I believe oh. Laura Williams contributed a, a lot of these dresses. Very and cool. And we put on a fashion show, you know, of... Yeah. Fashions from all different years. Ah. And and, uh, and maybe... No, never mind. Very cool. And and that's out in front of the high school? And this is in front of the Liberty Theater. Oh, okay. Which is where Got, we yeah, had that. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, but there were a lot of fundraising activities up here like this, just to keep things going. Yeah, yeah. And people got very creative and did all sorts of things like that. And this is what? Uh, I was a freshman in college, if I remember correctly. So that would have been 71, 72, okay. somewhere along in there. Okay. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Oh, certainly. I had to do this more often. <laughs> and have people, you know. Well, you know. It's, uh, it's not exactly Ken Burns, but... Well, but you're our Ken Burns. Yeah, I'm a Jerome's Ken Burns. <laughs> oh, okay, one more. This okay. Is, this is me going to school. Okay. It was a first day of school picture in front of my house uh, in Hampshire. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, that's, um, is, is that Paul and, I mean, is that Jerry's house that no. you were walking past? No, that's my house. That's your house. And tell me again which one it is, because I, I so that was so long ago in it's our conversation. It's in between where Randy Roark's house is and the one that's owned by Tracy Wiesel that's painted dark green right now. So it's painted yellow with green and white trim. 
And I think the people who own the mine have Oh, it. oh, oh, that's where um, uh, Kevin uh, Savage is. Yeah. Kevin and, and yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. That was your, your folks' yeah. uh, property. So I, ha uh, I have to laugh because I can see they painted that house yellow, and uh -huh. I can see that the pink paint that my dad put on there for my mom is still trying to show through that yellow. <laughs> I can still see it. You can still see it. Yeah, because uh, we always call, everyone in my family called that the pink house. Uh -huh. And my dad put so many gallons of paint on that stucco. He just said, that stuff is just sucking up paint like you can't believe. <laughs> and of course, the scaffolding that you have to put on someplace like that. Oh, I have a couple more interesting shots. This one is of the Jerome State Historic Park, and this is when both the head frames were still standing. Oh. That's Bill Cruz, who with my dad worked on the building uh, as they were converting it into a state park. Cool. And, okay, one more family shot. Okay. This is my mom and dad and I in front of oh. our house. Yeah, there we go. Say again. My mom and dad and I in front of our house. Ah. Oh, great. Thanks. Sure. Oh, another person that comes to mind uh, to talk about was is Clarence Beale. Haven't heard of him. Oh. Have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly. <clears throat> Clarence Beale was connected with the mines too, and he lived over uh, behind the Little Daisy, those houses that are up there behind Bell Row. Okay. There are two up there, and. I honestly do not remember exactly what his job was with the mining company. He was a great, tall, bald man with a booming voice and well into his later years, very, very active. I remember somebody talking about the way he would stride up the stairs at the courthouse in Prescott. And uh, when the when the big snow happened in '65, I believe it was, or was that '67? And someone said, "Mr. Beale, what can we bring for you?" And he didn't want to uh, impose on anybody very much, so he said, "Just bring me some bird seed and some whiskey." <laughs> he wanted to make sure the birds got fed and he had a drink. <laughs> so this is, I was working the camera there. Mr. Beale was who here? In Clarence Beale. Clarence he was, Beale. I don't remember exactly what his function was with the mining company. Oh, okay. I just remember he was, you know. Quite the character. Yes, another Jerome character, certainly. And, well, people talk about the big snow, I'm sure. No, I haven't heard. <gasps> Really? Mm -mm. Oh, this, Only in passing, maybe. Oh, this, this snowstorm moved in about Christmas time and dumped, oh my goodness, you have to look this up, dumped so much snow. A couple feet? Oh, yeah. It just stayed stationary. They have pictures of Clarkdale with snow up to those the tops of those old fences. Really? And Jerome, we were really, we had no electricity. And we would open the windows and put our food in between the window and the screen to keep it cold because it was that cold out. Oh, my goodness. And uh, wore a lot of clothes. <laughs> how, <laughs> if how, you many, had, how many feet do you think you got? Oh, I can't even remember what it was, uh, but it was, it was historic. I don't think ever before or after in the history has it been that. Huh, a pretty storm much. that just stayed that long and just continued to dump snow like that. And shut everything down. And shut yes. everything down. Yeah, these days it's gone in three days. Right. Yeah. So my dad and there was an, another school teacher, uh, a young woman, and I who went down in his old pickup truck and got food for various people. And there was one lane that you could drive down. I mean, we didn't encounter anyone, obviously, because I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> Somehow they got, you know, enough 
that you could drive one car. They plowed enough. Yeah. Wow. And I remember this young teacher was a short woman. And I remember her walking through snow. It looked like she was up to her waist. I don't think my dad would even let me get, get out certain places to take whatever supplies were needed to people. But that was, you'll have to research that because that was definitely a big thing up here. I the guess. big snow. The big snow. That's what it's known? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll check it out. Yeah, I, and I think the Verde Independent um, had photos. I think you can maybe even look it up on. Okay, yeah, that, I'm trying to remember if that's come up before. Maybe, I think in one interview, I can't remember who it was, yeah. but in passing. Yeah, well, that but, that was, you know, early on, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, how do you think we did? Should, uh, are we forgetting anything? No, I think that you and I both share wor a worry about the gentrification of Jerome. Yeah. Well, I have a final question that yes. regards that. Yes. Um, let's wrap it up with that. I ask right. everyone that I sit down with um, if you could put a message in a bottle to Jeromans 50 years from now, 25 years from now. What would it say? Keep the place up, but don't, don't change it so much that it loses what is attractive, what is charming. Yeah. Preserve that. Yeah. And don't let money get so much in the way that it ruins everything. Keep the characters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all feel that way. Yeah. And like I said, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, to hold on to that feeling as long as we I can. I appreciate you trying to <laughs> save the history of this place. Yeah. Thank you. It's been fun and interesting. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I'm honored. Sue Smalt, thank you so much for coming today. I really Certainly. appreciate it. And um, bye. Bye.